Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless the bible indicates that there will be a great apostasy during the end times as we read in second thessalonians 2 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition falling away is the greek word apostasia which means defection from the truth properly the state apostasy. Apostasia, from which we get the English word apostasy, refers to a general defection from the true God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. The end times will include a rejection of God's word, a further falling away of an already fallen world. By looking at the news headlines of our world today, there can be no doubt we are living in the final moments before Jesus' return. Uh, falling away from biblical beliefs about sexuality among priests in the Church of England. A Christian leader in the United Kingdom tells CDN News they no longer believe in the gospel or the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Priests conducting same-sex weddings, biblical teachings giving a green light to homosexuality and premarital sex. A recent London Times survey found those startling opinions among members of the clergy in the Church of England. On this week's episode of The Global Lane, Andrea Williams, CEO of the UK group Christian Concern, finds those views shocking for a church that once shared its biblical values with the world. It is a shocking uh, survey, and it was on the front page of The Times in the United Kingdom. 53% of those surveyed approved same-sex marriage. 59% said that they would offer same-sex blessings. 67% support a ban on so-called conversion therapy. As a sign of his coming in the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith and false teachers would rise up as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness 
may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, also, uh, Christians who pray outside abortion clinics or preach the gospel on the street, they get arrest arrested. So it, it seems like Christianity is in decline in the UK, not only for the Church of England. So why has that occurred? What do you see happening in the days ahead? It's tragic on many levels. It's really tragic that this beautiful, great nation of Britain that has led the world in many ways in Christianity in terms of shaping a way of life, shaping a culture around the gospel. The idea that we could have forgotten the gospel, that we could have forgotten the place of Jesus Christ in public life, that is indeed a reality. What I find so stark is that the Church of England within the public institutions and those that represent the Church of England would seek to reflect the culture, ape the culture, rather than speaking of the glorious transformative news, uh, good news that is found in Jesus Christ. So I think that we have forgotten our great heritage, but most of all, we've forgotten our passion, our love for Jesus. And we've been ashamed of Jesus and his words. We've been ashamed of the gospel. So that's certainly a corporate that's where we are in corporate Christianity. I don't believe that everything is lost. And the churches that are growing, and indeed the Anglican churches that are growing, the Church of England churches that are growing, are the churches not that give in to liberal thinking, not that give in to the, 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 the culture of the world, but those that uphold the culture of Christ. I am excited today for our guest, Dr. Vodi Bakum. I want to get into your, your book. And what's interesting about this book, The Ever-Loving Truth, this came out initially, the first version of it, in 2004, I believe. It's been almost 20 years now. What has changed during those 20 years that made you want to bring this book back out? Wow. You know, it's interesting. In some ways, um, very little has changed in the sense that from a, a worldview perspective and from an antagonism to the gospel perspective, uh, we're still traveling along the same slope. Uh, but in another way, uh, everything has changed. There's so many different manifestations of the various uh, anti-Christian ideologies out there. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to uh, revise and, and re-release this book to kind of make that point that on the one hand, um, we're still in the midst of a culture of the same kind of opposition. And on the other hand, that opposition um, looks different in a number of ways and looks um, a lot more antagonistic than it was. It's interesting because you look at some of the research that's out there and Dr. George Barna, you know, he's every year they're putting out this American worldview inventory. And this year it said that 4% of Americans have a biblical worldview. That was down from 6% in 2020. And it made me wonder, you know, in a lot of this sort of chaos and confusion, it seems like 
there's also a responsibility on, on our part to really make sure we understand scripture and understand truth. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, because it does feel like we've let culture come in far too much to the church. Yeah, we absolutely have. And the majority of uh, pastors don't have a biblical worldview. And that's the, that's the shocking one, right? That's the one that you have yeah. to marinate on for for a while <laughs> is that, you know, the majority of pastors don't don't operate from a biblical worldview. So I, it's scary, actually. It, it really it's is. Scary. It really <laughs> is. And that's part of what lulled us to sleep. Christianity was so accepted and so prevalent that we began to market it. Right. It, it began to be a great way to make a living. Right. A great way to become famous. And a lot of people just continued to shave the edges off the gospel in order to gain large audiences and use the large audiences as the proof that that they were, you know, doing what God wanted them to do. I think a couple of things we have to do. Number one, we have to commit ourselves to truth, regardless of the costs and consequences. Um, secondly, we need to make our calling and election sure. We need to test ourselves, right? We, the, the scriptures commend that to us, testing ourselves to see if we're in the faith. We need to examine ourselves and not just assume that what we're doing is right and what we're thinking is right. First Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. First John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does it mean to test the spirits? The reason for the admonition to test the spirits, or test all things, is that there are many false prophets, or wolves in sheep's clothing, that try to lead Christians astray. Sadly, there are many people who claim to speak for God, who are presenting a false gospel that is powerless to save. Such errant teaching leaves people with a false hope of salvation. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15 warns us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The reason for testing the spirits is to see if it is truly from God, or if it is a lie from Satan and his servants. The test is to compare what is being taught with the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is the Word of God. It alone is inspired and inerrant. Therefore, the way to test the spirits is to see if what is being taught is in line with the clear teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the Berean Jews were commended because after they heard the teachings of Paul and Silas, they examined the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were called noble for doing so. Testing the spirits means that one must know how to examine the Scriptures. Rather than accept every teaching, discerning Christians diligently study the Scriptures. Then they know what the Bible says and therefore can test all things and hold fast to what is true. In order to do this, a Christian must be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is to be a lamp and a light to our path. We must let its light shine on the teachings and doctrines of the day. The Bible alone is the standard by which all truth must be judged. 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 1 Timothy 4.16 Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And then we need to always continue to submit ourselves to the ordinary means of grace. We need to be sitting before the Word of God on a regular basis. We need to be sitting before the ministry of the Word on a regular basis. The Lord's Supper and baptism and, you know, prayer and worship, these things need to be a regular part of what punctuates our lives. You know, as we're rounding out the conversation, Vodi, I want to ask if you can just give us maybe an encouragement and edification for the church as we're walking into these hot button issues, because it feels oftentimes like we're walking right into the fire. But as Christians, we know that the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God is sufficient uh, to handle whatever we're facing. So maybe just give us an encouragement as we're closing out this conversation. The encouragement is we win in the end. That That's the encouragement. God doesn't promise us that we will win 
every battle. He doesn't promise us that we will win in every, you know, situation. But what we do know is that we, as the body of Christ, win because Christ wins in the end. And so we serve Christ not because we believe that it will, you know, sort of get us uh, victory in every setting, circumstance, or situation. But we serve Christ because he is Lord. He's not trying to be Lord. He's not going to be Lord. He is Lord. And as long as we can remind ourselves that Christ is Lord, and we can endure whatever setbacks or hardships that we have to endure while we wait for his victory. The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, Whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society, the one absolute, and therefore intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19-22, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes. There is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth, is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. 
It meant that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.